of initiatives and we increase the number of oxygen beds from around 1400 to around 15000 within a span of 2 months the number of icu beds were also increased from 400 to around 1378 and the ventilators supported bed also increased from around 300 to 865 We have started installing around 60 PSA plants in our state in various uh, hospitals, especially the public hospitals, to prevent any chance of any shortage of oxygen in the state, though Jharkhand has been the state which has supplied oxygen to around 16 states as well as to Nepal during this pandemic. For preparation regarding the third wave, as far as the target and the magnitude of the issue is concerned, and as uh, is being uh, anticipated, that uh, people below the age of 18 would be more susceptible to third wave since they have not yet been vaccinated. The government is uh, already conducting its tests for vaccinating the population below 18 years. We have around 1.43 crore population below 18. And if we take positivity at 5% and around 7 lakh people would be affected. And if 40% are symptomatic, then it will be around 2.9. And based upon that formula, we'll have those who are uh, severely affected would be around 9,000. And moderate would be around 43,000 if this wave comes. We have already started preparing for the third wave. Uh, the training of doctors, because we are running short of pediatricians in the state. We have started uh, training of the other doctors and uh, training is already going on in uh, our uh, Center of Excellence Rims, Rani Hospital and uh, TMH in Jamshedpur. The paramedical staff is also being uh, mobilized so that we don't have any shortage as we expressed and felt in uh, during the second wave. The infrastructure is also beefed up we are also procuring ambulances, especially for the children. 24 ambulances would be procuring for uh, children in each district would be having one ambulance and if required, then we would go for more. Medicines also are being procured. Equipments, especially the ventilators for the children and other medical equipment is also being procured. I had a opportunity to attend the national meeting on the Aishman Bharat just uh, a day back and uh, the government of India has increased the cost of package for Aishman Bharat so that the beneficiaries who were deprived of uh, being covered under Aishman would now be covered. The cost has been increased I also requested to in include the multi-organ inflammatory syndrome in children in that package and that has also been included. Dr. Bharti Kashyap would be pleased to know that and even all other doctors. The strategy now is to prevent third wave and for that we have to beef up our facilities and prevent the spread because right now we have around uh, only 830 cases in the state, active cases. And out of these active cases, 222 are symptomatic, rest are asymptomatic. So it is very less and very manageable. We have taken certain uh, strong steps 
so that uh, the testing at the entry points, especially at the railway station, at the airports, and on the uh, roads, the national highways and highways which are entering our state, the testing has been beefed up so that uh, we don't leave anybody who's coming from outside. But because now the threat is from outside, because since, as I told you, the positivity is quite low, and every day also we are getting less than 100 positive cases. Only 222 are symptomatic. So the strategy is to test and to isolate those who are positive and they should be mandatorily be quarantined and isolated in the hospital. We are also stressing upon tracking after this uh, testing, tracking of with whom all these positive patients came into contact so that we don't leave any chance of any positive uh, person roaming around freely. And then the strategy of treating them, as I told you. As far as vaccination is concerned, the state has taken a lot of initiative. And our vaccination rate has now increased to around 1.25 lakhs per day, which was around 30,000, 40,000. Around uh, 70 lakh population has been vaccinated. And uh, we hope that if we get vaccines in time, since it is being supplied by government of India, we have capacity to go to around 3 lakhs per day. Because once the momentum is built up, and if there is shortage of vaccine, then it becomes difficult to sustain that momentum. So we are stressing upon Government of India so that we get vaccines, sufficient supplies of vaccines, so that we can accelerate this vaccination drive and uh, ensure that our citizens are protected and shielded. For Enforcing the COVID appropriate behaviors, we have come up with a strategy of uh, community policing, which is uh, now being in the initial stages and would be exercised in greater proposition. Yesterday in Delhi, also I found that uh, at each every each and every crossings on the road, people and policemen and people with the identity were. Uh, stressing upon those and even finding those persons who were not uh, even uh, having masks. So this mass social distancing and sanitization, the SMS, social distancing, masking and sanitization. This SMS is very, very critical as far as COVID appropriate behavior is concerned. So we are uh, focusing on these strategies so that we don't uh, allow the third wave to come, but to prepare ourselves from any eventuality. As I elaborated, we have uh, taken uh, all necessary steps. Uh, I presented, uh, we, the Harkin government has uh, prepared, it was the first state in the country to prepare the document, the manual for uh, handling and tackling this third wave. And after that, government of India also came up with that. We were the first uh, state to organize a national webinar on this, which had all uh, specialist doctors. And uh, when I presented this uh, manual to Honorable Central Minister, Dr. Harshwardhan, he said that he doesn't believe in third wave. He said it is a useless document. <laughs> useless document. I told him that this document basically is a preventive document. We cannot... Uh, be casual and lethargic and uh, ignorant. We have to be alert. We should not be caught off guard. It doesn't come, it doesn't make any loss to us. We prepare and uh, beef up our infrastructure, uh, manpower, resources, medicines. In fact, uh, taking advantage of this COVID, we have started improving our hospital uh, management. Also, every day we are getting reports from our public hospitals and uh, the, it has started showing results also. Uh, Dr. Bharti Kashyap and Dr. Jayesh Lele 
they raised the issue of uh, protection of uh, doctors against any untoward incident. And uh, you would be pleased to know that I already requested Dr. Bharti Gashyap that if and other doctors of IMA, if uh, a standard document or any document of any state is made available to us, since uh, the lead has already been taken by certain states, we won't uh, lag behind and you not, need not make any request to us for making this because you are part of our team. And we consider you as a, a very valuable resource and, uh, and we would take all steps to protect. You should not be worried at all. No doctor should worry. We are always behind them, always uh, willing to support them and will not leave any stone unturned in ensuring their protection. So, very soon we will be having the protective mechanism in place, though we had already issued a notification in that regard around uh, six or seven months back. But if any more teeth is to be added, we'll add that to that. So, as I elaborated, we are uh, prepared, we have taken a lot of steps and I am quite hopeful that today's deliberation would also strengthen the, the intention and the commitment of uh, the, all the doctors who are participating, our civil surgeons are uh, participating and uh, we would ensure that uh, we will not allow the third wave to enter our state and even if somebody comes to be affected from third wave, then we'll take adequate steps to treat and ensure that nobody dies. We had a, a bad experience of uh, mucormycosis. Around 152 persons have been identified, out of, out of which 86 are uh, diagnosed and 66 are not uh, clear whether it is a case of mucormycosis. 26 uh, of our uh, valuable lives of uh, patients suffering from mucormycosis have been lost. But uh, the government has declared this as a uh, epidemic and uh, we are taking all steps to prevent any more loss of life as far as mucormycosis is concerned. So this is what is uh, my submission and I thank Dr. Bharti Kasha for organizing, taking the lead and she has been a very, very active person full of uh, enthusiasm. I wish you all good luck and uh, hope that uh, this seminar would uh, strengthen us and make us more committed towards handling this third wave. Thank you very much. Sir, uh, so we are, uh, thank you, sir. Thank you so much for your uh, blessings. And uh, before we, now we are going to start. So our uh, secretary, Dr. Pradeep Singh, sir, are you here? Is muted. So he is there, he is muted, I think. So please unmute Kardi Jonko. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Bharti, for organizing uh, International Symposium on PICU and Critical Care. My best wishes. Thank you, sir. For the success of this symposium. Thank you very much. Once again. Thank you, sir. So now we are going to start the first session of 15 minutes in which Dr. Ravi Kashyap, Associate Professor from University of Illinois, would be presenting COVID-19 third wave. Is it preventable? Emergency triage and assessment of work of breathing in detail, adult COVID-19 presentation. Is it different from children? Importance of early recognition and transfer to pediatric ICU, intermediate care center. So uh, over to you, Dr. Ravi. So we have not introduced Dr. Ravi. We know Dr. Ravi is the associate professor in the University of Illinois. So, oh, okay, please start. Thank you so much. Um... Uh, in the interest of time, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Bharti Kashyap to uh, organize such an important topic today and uh, allowing me to be a part of it. 
I like to have special thanks for Honorable Health Minister Sri uh, Banna Gupta, Honorable Health Secretary Dr. Arun Kumar Singh, and uh, very good speech. Um, he pretty much covered what I'm going to talk about today, so that's great. I'd like to welcome again uh, National President of Indian Medical Association Dr. J. Jayala, uh, Honorable Secretary General Indian Medical Association Dr. Jayesh Lele, and NHM Director Ravi Shankar Shukla. So um, as, uh, as I said, uh, honestly, uh, Dr. Arun Kumar Singh has pretty much covered very well what I'm gonna talk about today. And I was happy to see that if I had anything to suggest, he has it covered. So with that, as we, as you mentioned that, you know, we have just been gone through the second wave and obviously, uh, you know, we are preparing for the third wave. I'm, I'm very proud and very happy to see that the government of Jharkhand as well as the healthcare providers of Jharkhand are so proactive. Uh, be prepared as, doc, as Dr. Arun Kumar Singh said that yes, we hope that third wave would not come, but we need to be prepared. So I totally agree with him. So with that, uh, is it preventable? Is a third wave preventable? Well, we definitely need to try, right? Um, so, if I can sum up my talk today in three words, that will be vaccination, vaccination, and precautions. So about the vaccines, what do we know? What do you know for sure what's happening? So COVID-19 vaccines are safe and effective at preventing COVID-19 disease, especially severe illness and death. Uh, recently, uh, the, that, uh, one of the studies came out from month of May in, in, in US, almost all the deaths due to the COVID-19 infection was in the patients who are not vaccinated. And in my personal experience in my own hospital, we have been kind of watching it since January of this year, only one person in my intensive care unit has died due to COVID-19 infection who was vaccinated. Everybody else was not vaccinated. Additionally, what we are seeing again in our own, own hospital 95% of the hospitalized patients with COVID-19 infection were not vaccinated. So clearly shows that no, no ifs, no buts, the, the vaccines are effective, no question about it. Additionally, the COVID-19 vaccines reduce the risk of people spreading the, the, uh, the virus causing COVID-19. So not only is helping to save the patient's lives, but the patients, people who have been vaccinated, they're also helpful and not spreading the infection. And that will help us to, to prevent the third wave. We all know there could be some side effects after vaccination. These are mild and usually they go away within a few days. Um, it typically takes about two weeks after vaccination for the body to develop the immunity. We know that against the virus. Um, now the person is not considered fully vaccinated until two weeks after the second dose of a two dose vaccine or two weeks after a single dose vaccine. Now, what are we still learning? There's a few things we're still learning. How will the vaccines protect the people with weakened immunity, immunocompromised systems, including people who take medicine that suppress the immune systems? So for example, transplant patients or somebody is requiring the immunosuppressant. We don't know for sure, but the signal so far shows that the likelihood is that the, 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 uh, the vaccines are helping to protect these patients as well. Again, we're still learning about that. So now other people, uh, again, it's an it's ongoing process. What we know for sure at this time that it works for at least six months. And this is coming from the, page, the, the people who participated into the, uh, um, the, the, the trials before the vaccine came. So we know it's for six months. It could be nine months, it could be 12 months, it could be lifelong, we don't know, but at least six months. Now, if it does not last, last long enough, we might need to get the, uh, uh, the booster shot. Now, again, the other thing we try to learn, how many people need to be vaccinated till we say we have a population immunity. We don't know that yet. Some people say 70%, some people say 80%. What is important, at least in my perspective, is it's not uniform. Meaning by we need to take, go region by region. A re, one region might be fully vaccinated. Other region may be only 20% vaccinated. So they cannot be treated equally. We need to realize that, that we need to look at our own 
region to see how well we are immunized. Not, it's important for the whole country to be immunized, but when we start looking into the uh, population immunity, we start looking into our own regional population immunity and immunization. We are also trying to learn how effective the vaccines are against the new variants of the COVID-19, for example, Delta, Delta Plus. And so far, the, it seems like the MRA, at least mRNA vaccines have been protective against the Delta and Delta Plus variants. Um, there could be more variants. Maybe we'll find something new. And if there is a case where the new variants are not covered by the, uh, the vaccines, then we may have to look into um, getting an, a, other uh, newer vaccine or maybe a, a booster shot. Now, what can we do to prevent the third wave? And when I say we, that means we as the healthcare providers in this, this meeting today, along with the help of the government, vaccinate everyone who is eligible to receive vaccine as soon, vaccine as, soon as possible. I'll also encourage and, 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 uh, and um, request there should be a robust and expedited testing on the younger kids for the vaccine to see if it, is, if it is safe for them and if it is effective for them. As you might know, in the United States, age 12 and above, uh, people are eligible to get the vaccination and they're ongoing testing right now as we speak, both with the Moderna and the Pfizer and other vaccinations. And if that test comes back to be positive, meaning by safe and effective, there is a possibility by September or October of this year kids as young as six months of age may be vaccinated. Again, that needs to be seen, we don't know. That's the ongoing testing right now. Um, other thing what we can do as healthcare providers, and I do the same thing, discuss vaccination with every patient who come to us. Doesn't matter, they're coming for lung problem or the cervical, cancer, cervical problem, or they're coming for a general health exam, eye exam, doesn't matter. Ask a question, have you received the vaccination? And if they have not, we need to not push them because we push them, they, they feel threatened and they, they may not get the vaccine, but ask what the concerns are. And I have been doing that. I have noticed there are a lot of myths that they, the patients come up with. And after talking with them, because they trust me, uh, they have been seeing me for a few years, I have been able to convince a good majority of them to get the vaccine. So please talk with your patients, you know, no matter, just one question, have you received the vaccine? If not, can I, can I ask, can I help you to, to answer your concerns? So please try to convince them if, if, if they have a concern that could be a myth actually. In the meantime though, we should keep taking precautions such as wearing masks, maintaining social distancing and hand washing till the number of new infection has been consistently low. Um, Dr. Bharti Keshap had kind of told me about this and Dr. Arun Kumar Singh has also mentioned today that the third wave of COVID-19, if it does come, it may affect upwards of 700,000 children in Jharkhand. That's a lot of uh, kids. Now, many of the children may experience only mild symptoms, but some may develop severe symptoms requiring admission to PICU or PI, uh, pediatric intensive care unit. Now, some children, irrespective of the severity of symptoms, meaning by at the time of infection, they may have had mild infection, may develop Missy in four to six weeks after they have been infected. And that's the important topic today that will be discussed very uh, well by the two speakers after uh, my, my talk today. So in general, what is the MISC? The multi-inflammatory, it is multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children or MISC, also known as pediatric multi-system inflammatory syndrome, temporarily related to SARS-CoV-2. It is a potentially serious illness um, and th that appears to be a delayed post-infectious complications of COVID-19 infection. It can, it can have a varied symptom that can affect several organs. Um, excuse me for a second. Uh, okay. Yes, um, I'm, I'm having help seeing my screen here. So, it, the many, it may affect many organs and, and systems in the, in the body. Many children have symptoms resembling toxic shock syndrome or Kawasaki disease in which the coronary arteries uh, may become enlarged or form aneurysms. Also common are heart, heart inflammation, impaired heart function, low blood pressure, rash, or red eyes, and gastrointestinal symptoms. These symptoms can occur in different combinations and will be expertly 
discuss later in this uh, web webinar today. In general, the common symptoms would be fever uh, that lasts more than 24 hours, vomiting, diarrhea, pain in the stomach, skin rash, feeling unusually tired, fast heartbeat, rapid breathing, red eyes, redness or swelling of the lips and tongue, redness or swelling of the hands or feet, headaches, dizziness, lightheadedness, and enlarged lymph nodes. More importantly, there are some warning signs that we, all the, 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 the healthcare providers should be aware of because these are the patient either should be taken care of right away or should be transferred to the place that can be taken care of. And these would include severe stomach pain, difficulty breathing, pale gray or blue colored skins, lips or nail beds, depending on their skin tone, new confusion, inability to wake up or stay awake. Um, while most of the children's, hos children's hospital in the United States and other medical facilities are still collecting data on, on MIS-C, it seems so far to be not very common, thankfully. For, thankfully. Most children recover to an excellent state of health with careful observation and treatment. Children with MIS-C may need to be hospitalized, but only a few percentage have passed away. So how do we prepare for the, the third wave of MSC? And I was so proud to, to, to listen to Dr. Um, uh, Honorable Health Secretary, Dr. Arun Kumar Singh, that how well prepared the Jharkhand has been and everything which I was gonna mention is being done. So basically, you know, establishing multiple PQs in different regions, which they have, as Dr. Arun Kumar Singh mentioned, that it has been already being done. Um, my suggestion would have been to assign each geographical area to a PQ so that uh, with a backup PQ, uh, PQ in case the first PQ does not have beds available. So this way, each region knows if I have a patient to transfer, where to call. Um, so there, there's a relationship between the a geographic region and the a PQ. There should be secure and prompt communication between the referring centers and providers of the PQ team. They should have been already talked to each other, know each other, have a relationship with each other, and have a trust with each other. Educate the healthcare providers, even in smaller communities, to recognize the warning signs so they can promptly call the PQU to transfer the patient. And this relationship between the small centers, uh, healthcare providers and, and PQU is very important because that's the, the conversation they need to have. Okay, this is what's happening to the patient. Explain, explain and be prepared to answer the questions. This way the PQU team can decide whether the patient needs to be transferred or the patient can be taken care of where they are. This way, the PQ can be utilized appropriately. They should be, as Dr. Karu Kumar Singh said, there's already 24 ambulances, uh, ambulances being uh, uh, designated for the transfer, which is very important. If PQ team decide patient to be transferred, then the transfer should be happening right away, no delays, meaning by within minutes. And that, that's the right thing to do is if, if a healthcare provider calls PQ, PQ said patient needs to be coming here, transportation should be like immediately available with no delay. Uh, again, as the, uh, the PQ team should be prepared. I was just learned from Dr. Arun Kumar Singh that they have been preparing the you know, a general practitioner to, to do the pediatric work as well, which is very important. They should be educated with management of MISC, uh, manage the, you know, have the protocol uh, and follow the protocol. And again, as, as the, the next two speakers will be talking more about the protocol, it's very important. Uh, and make appropriate laboratory tests, equipments, and drugs available. And I think they'll be also elaborated by the next two speakers. So with that, I think um, I will stop and take any questions if you have. Thank you, Dr. Ravi. Uh, your part was basically uh, the suggestions and uh, now you very well know after the address of uh, Honorable uh, Arun Kumar Singh that the government has prepared a lot. There are a lot of ambulances, new PQ coming up at Pramandali Hospital as well as district hospitals. But the need is to connect and uh, there may be a common patho lab connecting the district PQ to the bigger PQ because uh, one common very advanced patho lab can justify the need of all those very fast blood reports. So any question from Dr. Uh, Divakar, PMH head, pediatrics? 
So over to Dr. Yonja Bullet. Dr. Yonja, are you there? Yes, I'm here. I'll be sharing my screen. Uh, can you hear me okay. well? Okay, just wait a moment. Dr. Yonja Bullet is Professor of Pediatrics, Department of Pediatrics, David Zeppelin School of Medicine, University of California and Los Angeles. Welcome, Yonja. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes, yes. Very much. Okay, very good. Oh, very good. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm honored to participate in this symposium. Uh, and today I'll be talking about the ICU management uh, of uh, the MISC. Uh, one second, please. She got a screen got a Um Okay, one second, I'm sorry. I'll just make sure that I will put this in. Okay, thank you. Uh, today, my objectives are, are um, uh, which children with COVID will be requiring hospitalization? Uh, how do we define severity? Um, and what are the presenting symptoms of COVID-19 in children? Uh, management of the hospitalized patients, what is necessary manpower, supplies, medical management? And what is MISC? Uh, 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 Dr. Ravi uh, Kashab already talked about it, but I will just open up a little bit more. And what are the current treatment modalities for um, MISC? And what are the presenting symptoms? Um, it is important to understand the assessment of the severity because not all children will be admitted. When we say uh, that in children, COVID usually are mild. In rare cases, children will be admitted. Only maybe 10% uh, uh, of the population had COVID, pediatric population had COVID. And in that, maybe a one, two percent got admitted. But when the numbers are so much, the 700,000 children could be affected, it would be important to understand the severity. So when we say mild and moderate disease, there is no increased oxygen requirement. When we say severe disease, this is new requirement for oxygen or increased requirement from the baseline oxygen needs. And when we say critical disease, this is new or increased need for it, some sort of invasive or non-invasive mechanical ventilation, sepsis, multi-organ failure, or rapid worsening of the clinical status. So why this is important? Because this is how we will decide that who will require hospitalization. If the patients have severe disease, meaning that requiring oxygen, they will require hospitalization. Of course, they are critical. Organ failure, they will require uh, hospitalization. But there are children that not severe, but they still may need uh, hospitalization and monitoring. Who are these children? If they have underlying conditions, such as immune compromised children, febrile children less than 30 days old with a COVID illness, genetic or neurological or metabolic disorders, congenital heart disease. Of course, we know that the obesity, diabetes, asthma, lung disease, and sickle cell are risk factors for these patients. So what are the signs of symptoms of COVID? How do COVID patients present? Um, in adults, there are mostly respiratory symptoms, but in children, they could present with uh, a fever, most of them, cough, shortness of breath. Uh, that's 63% of the symptoms. They may come with myalgia, diarrhea, abdominal pain. Uh, loss of smell is not as much as in the, uh, the adults, like only 8%. They will not be feeding well. Or they may come in a very severe condition with the respiratory failure, myocarditis, shock, acute renal failure, a multi-organ um, failure, an intussusception or an appendicitis and up with the abdomen or a diabetic ketoacidosis. The diabetes cases are also increasing. And by the time that we see these children, there are a lot of diabetic ketoacidosis. So what are the laboratory tests that we order? What are we looking? Simply a complete blood count. There may be some lymphopenia or lymphocytosis. But we are looking for a complete metabolic panel, meaning in just the electrolytes and the liver enzymes. Because if the liver enzymes are elevated and lymphopenia, that may be a poorer prognosis. It will be important to have blood culture and urine culture. Remember, this is not every children. These are the children that severe or they have underlying conditions required hospitalization. And then CRP, ESR, procalcitonin, 
any one of them to check if there is inflammation. Coagulation test may helpful too. Chest X-ray is not necessary for every single children, but if they have any respiratory distress or oxygen requirement, it may be beneficial. What we see is unilateral or bilateral infiltrates. And if there is severe, you could order a CT. And in the CT, this ground glass opacities on CT and the consolidation with this halo looking, that halo sign, this is, this is how the halo sign will look like in the CT scan. In the management of the hospitalized patients, what do we need? Pediatric ICU care or an intermediate care? What do we need in those hospital beds? Uh, uh, monitors and the ventilator connection, an oxygen connection. I equip the monitor a heart rate, blood pressure, temperature, and oxygen saturation. And the manpower is also important. Pediatric nursing, of course, it may not be, of course, one to four, um, but nursing for ICU patients are important, pediatric patients. A pediatric ICU physician, even if there's a centralized pediatric ICU physician, could help the others. Doesn't have to be at, like, you know, uh, for a, even a 20, 30 bed uh, pediatric ICU. And pediatric anesthesiologists or an adult anesthesiologists, important to manage the airway because pediatric airways are, uh, they are not just small adults. It's quite complex sometimes, and you want the most experienced person intubating these children. If centralized pediatric pharmacist is so essential because of the drug doses, that if you are giving that, which dose, how to give it, if you have, don't have that one. If there's a centralized pediatric pharmacist, it will be very important to help uh, everyone about how much fluid to give, uh, what kind of fluids to be given, and if there is available respiratory therapists. What are the equipments, the supplies, monitoring devices, a pulse oximetry, oxygen supplies? But having the oxygen is not enough. Having the delivery system, uh, children will require smaller tubes, smaller cannulas, smaller prongs and for their nose. So the pediatric sizes is important. So even if you have oxygen, you may not be able to deliver the children. The high flow nasal cannula and simple masks, the children's size simple masks, non-breeder masks necessary again for the ventilators. So how do we treat the oxygen, like treatment recommendation for oxygen therapy and non-invasive mechanical support? First, the children initially, we thought that the COVID children, the children with the COVID has to be uh, treated differently. There was a lot of difference in opinions that initially about how to manage these children don't use high flow, don't intubate, intubate early. We find out after a year later that we should just continue what we are doing before, giving a good or critical care. So that if the child is requiring oxygen, if their saturation in room air is less than 94, 92, just a regular nasal cannula oxygen. If this is not enough, then you could add a reservoir bag. And if this is not enough, then you could just escalate to a high flow nasal cannula oxygen. If these children are wheezing, and if you need to use a nebulizer, because of contamination on everywhere, it's important to maybe use a meter dose inhaler, those puff ones, instead of the aerosolized ones. Uh, and then if the child has failed the high flow of nasal cannula oxygen, then a BiPAP machine could be used before ventilator. If you decide the ventilator, it is the most important to, uh, to be bagged and intubated with the most senior person and should be intubated with a cuffed endotracheal tube, meaning that so that the, the uh, particles will not spread everywhere. And here I'm showing a picture of the uh, viral filter. So this viral filter is also important to connect. So that will prevent uh, all the COVID uh, uh, particles to uh, spread uh, uh, around while you are bagging the child. And ventilator management is, is similar. But it's really important that bagging, masking, and intubation could be done with a skilled person and children. Otherwise, the other people could get also get infected. And staff should use and contact and droplet precautions and N95 mask. If you are using aerosol generation with the high flow, BiPAP, or intubation. If the child is in shock, the, since the COVID is a viral sepsis and a septic shock due to a viral sepsis, surviving sepsis guidelines continue. I put the QR code for the survival sepsis guidelines, and in this one gives you the blood pressures that expected. So if the patient is in shock, obtaining an IV, 
and continuing what's necessary with the fluid resuscitation. And these are the uh, blood pressures for the age groups that you could uh, you could pull it from the uh, with the uh, QR um, uh, QR code. And if you don't, if there is no blood pressure cuff, and if you need to see if this patient is in shock or not. Of course, you could use the World Health Organization criteria of cold extremities, prolonged capillary refill greater than two seconds, and a weak and fast pulses. If the patient is in shock, and uh, important to be not to be so aggressive with the fluid resuscitation, if there is hypoperfusion but the normal blood pressure, if the blood pressure is okay, we should not continue giving fluids because they may not be able to intubate or ventilate this patient if it gets fluid overloaded. So if the patient is in shock and has low blood pressure according to the, these criteria, then you could give the 10 to 20 cc per kilo fluid boluses and continue with the, another 10 to 20 as long as the patient is requiring an appropriate pressors. The management of children with the hospitalized children. Um, Remdesivir is an antiviral and antiviral drug that uh, that uh, its be, or benefits are being um, uh, shown in the uh, clinical trials with adults. There is currently uh, it's only used for the emergency use authorization for children less than uh, 12 years old. If the children are above 12 years old and if they are requiring oxygen, it could be used as an antiviral agent. And again, the steroids showed improved outcome in adult studies in the recovery trial, but effectiveness of steroids in children is not sufficiently evaluated. We have to be careful when we are exploring data from the adult studies. So in these adult studies, the decadron may be beneficial for so some children that if you are requiring not just one or two liters of oxygen, but if they are requiring high flow of nasal cannula oxygen or mechanical ventilation, you may consider dexamethasone, decadron, and if the decadron is not available, you could consider prednisolone or methylprednisolone. And the co-infections are uh, could happen uh, with the viruses, other viruses, RSV, influenza, and rhinovirus. Right now, we are seeing quite a bit of uh, RSV, influenza, rhinovirus here in the United States. Uh, also, secondary bacterial infections are important, fungal infections. Aspergillosis and mycormacosis. Uh, mycormacosis, uh, uh, that, uh, that uh, it's been mentioned that uh, there was, uh, I guess, like 152 uh, patients with that. Uh, this could happen. Usually, we see it in immunocompromised patients. It is important. What does rhizopus, mucor, loves? It loves glucose and it loves iron. So, it's important to have a good glucose control and avoiding steroids and maybe avoiding giving iron supplements if the patient is on some sort of a vitamin supplement or iron supplementation. And of course, if necessary, antifungals. Uh, so, starting empiric antibiotics would be useful. MISC. So um, we talked about it. Uh, uh, Dr. Ravi Kashab uh, talked about the uh, MISC, what it is, multi-system inflammatory syndrome. These children developed a failure, a multi-organ failure or shock for six weeks later, but 50% of them had asymptomatic COVID. So they will not come and tell you that they had COVID. So 50%, they don't even know that they had COVID, but they come in four weeks, six weeks later with a shock picture. There are multiple definitions, but this is the two that we are accepting, the CDC and WHO definition, the age of 21 or less, fever, multisystem involvement, meaning that severe illness, uh, and two organ involvement, or any of these two of the organ involvement, laboratory evidence of inflammation in both definitions, and uh, increase, either increased CRP, ESR, procalcitonin, uh, but regardless of the CDC versus who, that both of them are requiring that no other explanation or no obvious microbial uh, cause. And recent infection of exposure of either a positive PCR, positive serology, a family person with the COVID, likely exposure in four weeks uh, has to be in the uh, definition. Uh, when we look at the COVID patients and the MISC patients, here in the left side, you are seeing a graph of seven-day moving average of the COVID patients in this 250,000 here in January and, and May just went down. 
and this is the MISC patients. You are seeing that the numbers are not that much. This is from CDC that I pulled. Um, so that when the COVID numbers were 250,000, your uh, MISC numbers were just 25. So it is a rare disease. However, it is a scary disease because if you miss it, that there could be a shock in multi-system involvement. And this is the age group of the disease. It's a little bit older children rather than the younger children. Um, as uh, Dr. Kashab talked about it, that the symptoms could be anything and everything. So this disease fools us. It could come with, a, uh, I have admitted patients that who are admitted as an appendicitis or a seizure disorder or other reasons. So they can come with fever and cardiovascular involvement with shock, uh, an abdominal pain, quite a bit of a, you know, GI symptoms we are seeing with the diarrhea. They could have rash, they may have neurological symptoms. And this week just uh, uh, published another one that, that retropharyngeal edema, so they may come with a lot of uh, uh, throat pain or um, uh, a sore throat. Um, and these are different. These children, uh, MISD children, are different than the Kawasaki disease. What are the differences? So, uh, it's more like a toxic shock syndrome than the Kawasaki shock or Kawasaki disease. When you look at that, the age is more like 9, 10 rather than 2 in Kawasaki disease. They have severe gastrointestinal symptoms. In the Kawasaki, we don't see that. Myocardial dysfunction, they come with shock. Uh, usually, Kawasaki disease doesn't come with a shock. Usually, toxic shock or the Kawasaki shock syndrome come with it. Uh, and the coronary artery dilatation is transient uh, in MISC and toxic shock, but it is, uh, uh, stays more for the, uh, the longer in the Kawasaki disease. Uh, they have D dimers and high troponin levels, which is not the case for the Kawasaki. Lymphopenia and thrombocytopenia, which is this is simple. If you just get a simple CBC, you will see that the Kawasaki children usually will have higher platelet count, but in the MIAC, they have lymphopenia and thrombocytopenia. Well, the good news is that they all respond to the same treatment of IVIG and steroids. So this is diagnostic pathway for MISC. We use here at UCLA and a lot of the institutions use the American College of Rheumatology, which has wonderfully spelled every, every step for us. And I can put the QR code here. And if you want to reach me through my email, I'll be happy to you know, direct you to uh, resources. So if a patient is admitted with all, this, all the criteria we suggested, that with fever, with uh, any of the, these two, and has a, some sort of a epidemiological link to the uh, SARS, then uh, we look at the next step. Does the patient is in shock or not in shock? If the patient is not in shock, you order tier one lab work. If the patient is in shock, then you order both tier one and tier two lab work. What are these lab works? So tier one lab work is your simple complete blood count, which is your white blood cell count, hemoglobin, hematocrit, and a complete metabolic panel, your electrolytes, and inflammation, either CRP or ESR, and your COVID test. If any one of these results come back with an elevated CRP, severely elevated ESR, or severe lymphopenia, thrombocytopenia, hyponatremia, hypoalbuminemia, then you will say, Wait a minute, maybe I should order further tests. And these are the tier two labs. That will be important for the centralized lab because these labs, these results may not come right away, such as brain nitrogen peptide and troponin that we depend quite a bit. Ferritin could be like an inflammatory uh, reactant could be found. And then here, the rest of it you are seeing. And if you go to the um, uh, guidelines, it will be all spelled in that one. If a patient is having this, it's very important to get an EKG and a cardiac echogram. And if there is shock, ordering both tier one and tier two lab work. And how will we treat these patients? Again, we follow the American College of Rheumatology guidelines, and which is the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, uh, recommends. And, and then you can pull it up from here. If the patient is in shock, or not? That's the first question. Is the patient has an LV dysfunction or coronary artery disease, which Dr. Puja uh, Kashak will talk about, an increased troponin or arrhythmia? 
if the patient has any of these things, yes or no. If the patient doesn't have any of those things, you could give a first line treatment of IVIG, immunoglobulin, a two gram per kilo, and over eight to 12 hours, maximum is 100 grams. And if you think that the child will be food overloaded for some reason, then you could give that in a two divided doses. If the patient has a refractory disease, then you could consider what is the definition of a refractory disease? It is persistent fevers, increased uh, uh, brain natriuretic peptide, ferritin, D-dimers, unexplained tachycardia. Child is still having quite a bit of inflammation. Then you could consider a low dose of methylprednisolone, one to two milligram per kilo, or an akinrite is available in IL-1 inhibitor. Let's say that if our patient is in severe shock, uh, and has any one of these, then the first line treatment will be a combination of IVIG and methylprednisolone. Of course, the fluid resuscitation, vasopressors and antibiotics. There are studies that could use both of them, for using both of them that's beneficial. And there are studies showing that uh, if the IVIG is not available, that using a, a high dose steroids uh, uh, could be uh, acceptable. There are two studies came out in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, last week that um, one of them was saying that uh, the, the Boston-based group, uh, the overcoming COVID, uh, in that group, IVIG plus prednisolone did a better outcome, showed a better outcome uh, than uh, just the steroid alone. Uh, but the international study, the BAT study, showing that the uh, methylprednisolone high doses um, uh, as good of a response, or there was no difference in the treatment. Again, the, or you could use anakindrix available. If any one of those are used, the children should be weaned from them on three weeks. And how about antithrombotic treatment in this? Again, same guidelines helps us. All patients should be started on a low dose aspirin for thromboplexis, unless if the platelet count is low, if there is bleeding or bleeding diathesis, that should not be done. Dose is three to five milligram per kilo and maximum is 81 milligram. Again, patient with MIS-C or coronary artery aneurysms uh, should be also on low dose aspirin. So who will require both the low molecular heparin and the low dose aspirin? Which patients are these that will require both of them that with the MISC diagnosis? Those are the ones that who will have current or prior VTE, uh, venothrombolic events, or severe LV dysfunction defined as less than 35% ejection fraction, elevated D-dimers, greater than 10 times the upper limit of the lab, or very large coronary aneurysms, Z-score greater than 10, will be on low molecular heparin and low dose aspirin. If none of these are, uh, in, uh, none of these are happening, but the patient is requiring ICU for whatever reason, then the prophylactic dose of anticoagulation therapy is the, whatever the protocol that could be used. And the antibiotics. MIS-C can present with the signs and symptoms that would be like a shock or a toxic shock. So it is important to start a broad spectrum antibiotic right away. You could choose a third generation cephalosporin, you could choose azosin or the plazo, uh, and then if the cultures are negative, you could, um, you could stop them. For the summary, the supportive care is very important. Empiric antibiotic therapy initially, Limited role of antivirals, remdesivir makes it maybe five days versus 15 days in adult population. Immunomodulating treatments, if there's a severe disease, shock, vasopressor use, uh, and uh, aneurysms, then IVIG plus steroids or IL-1 inhibitors, like the, the, the shared with the protocol, or less severe manifestations could be managed with IVIG alone. If there is for prevention of the thrombotic events, low dose aspirin will be useful or the, uh, or the uh, anticoagulation as I shared before. Uh, the follow-up of the patients, uh, Dr. Uh, Fuja uh, Kashap will go over this, but pediatric cardiology should follow the patient. And if there's a normal function, uh, just the two weeks later an echocardiography. And then uh, if there's um, dilatation of aneurysms, maybe in every two or three days, but I will let Dr. Pujak talk about that.
important than limiting the physical activity for a period of time, three to six months after the, the severe hospitalization with MISC. And if the children uh, had uh, cardiac involvement, should be followed up with pediatric cardiologists and pediatric rheumatologists if they are on any of the biologic agents of their births. Thank you very much. Um, me. Uh, Dr. Diva, thank you so much, Dr. Yonja. We are, uh, we are really thankful that on 4th July, which is a national holiday, you all guys have taken time out in the midnight. So um, thank you once again. So there is a, uh, our discussant is TMH uh, Jamshedpur Pediatrics Head, Dr. Divakar. So Dr. Divakar, are you there? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Keshav, and thank you, Dr. Yonka Bolet. And that's an excellent presentation, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, I have a few questions, probably you do, you do not cover uh, because of the lack of time. How do you feed on a HFNC? So do you reduce the flow during feeding or you continue the same flow? And second question is, uh, how do you wean them? So once you wean them, they have to bring down the uh, flow directly to the low flow or you wean the flow as well. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you for the question. For the high flow, we usually, the maximum high flow that we will use is two cc per kilo. Uh, for the uh, for the high flow rate, let's say it's a ten kilo patient that I will not use more than uh, uh, twenty on that patient. Uh, we will start slow. So the minimum amount of flow that is necessary that I would use, especially in a COVID patient, that uh, if the patient is let's say uh, six liters and a thirty percent, and if this is a little desaturated, maybe it is better to just go up on the uh, the oxygen a little bit. Again, if the patient has atelectasis and not taking deep breath or uh, this, you're requiring the, if, or if it's a burp of breathing, because what you're trying to do with the high flow is um, prevent high burp of breathing. So then you will go up on the flow, not in the oxygen. Does this uh, answer the question uh, or? Um... Thank you. And how do you win them? So you reduce the... You directly yeah. go to low flow or you wean flow and then go to low flow? So uh, depending on the patient, if the patient, I try to wean the flow first. Uh, if I bring the oxygen level to, let's say, 30%, if the patient is a 100%, if the patient is a 60, 50%, I will not wean the flow. I'll bring the flow to the, I'll bring the oxygen level to 30%, let's say, first, then slowly come down on the flow. When you're coming down on the flow, if the patient becomes tachypnic, then your patient is telling you that it needs that little bit of the, um, uh, the, the peak that, that you're generating. Uh, then I will be in the, um, uh, the flow. When the flow hits the four liters, I'll just uh, switch to a regular cannula oxygen. Uh, thank you. And, and when do you consider it's a failure? So it's a five to cut off 60% or you go beyond 60% on the high flow as well. Once you have uh, this uh, maximum, yeah. Multiple things. It is not just the amount of the FiO2. If a patient is in requiring, uh, a, of course, 100% uh, high flow and is, a, let's say, a 10 kilo patient, so 20 liters, um, uh, that, is, that is quite a bit. I will be preparing for an intubation on that patient because there is no other, um, uh, other avenue. There is nothing left. Um, and tachypnea is also important too. Uh, so it isn't just one thing. The patient could be on 40 liters and it could be on 20 liters and 40%, but the respiratory rate of the same child, 10 kilo child has 80 of respiratory rate, then, then, then that is a failure. So the combination of the respiratory rate, combination also of the, if the saturation is going to the 92 in FiO2 greater than let's say 50% uh, and is requiring more and more um, FI, uh, flow and tugging, flaring, nasal flaring, tugging, using all the extra um, uh, accessory mus muscles, so all of them combination. So do you go beyond 60%? Uh... Yes, yes, we go, but sometimes we go beyond 60%, but if I'm going on 60% in a patient, uh, let's say the patient's on 100% FiO2 uh, and um, uh, 10 liters uh, flow or 20 liters flow, uh, you could do that. It, is it because like, because you just wanna give somebody a Lasix diuretics to just, uh, uh, you just need some, a couple of hours to make things better. Yes, you could use it, yes, you could use it. 
And if thank you don't you. have a ventilator, you could use it long term. Of course, you could use it. Okay, thank you, Dr. Kasab. Do you have time for more discussion or? Yes, I do. Uh, what I think that please stay connected, uh, Dr. Yon, uh, you can ask. Uh, you, you have one more question to Dr. Yonja. Yes, I, I do. Yes, yes, you do. You are from Jamshedpur and a lot of uh, ministers area. Please continue. Dr. Divakar is there from the TMH head oh. meditation. So, Dr. Regarding the feeding and the oral feeding, so do, do you reduce uh, flow during feeding or you are happy with the 2 ml per kg flow and uh, uh, oral feeding if possible, if respiratory tissue uh, is not there? If you say that in the old days, we said that if you're on high flow, we are not feeding, or if you're on a BiPAP, we are not feeding. feeding. But now that the, uh, and the lately in the last uh, year or so, that the research is showing that, that it does not make a difference. So what makes a difference is the child is throwing up if you're when you're giving a high flow and feeding, don't feed. If the child is not throwing up, continue feeding. If the child is, is on 100 person and a 20 liter, you're just gonna intubate this child, of course needs to be an MPO, don't feed it. So it is all about the child, what the child is needs. Uh, if it's getting things are getting worse, I wouldn't feed. But there is no rule that I'm on high flow, I'm not gonna feed. Yes, you can feed the children on high flow. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Of course. Because uh, we need you as a discussant for the third session also. So thanks, Dr. Yonja, for staying awake till midnight. Thank, Thank you. you so much. So uh, I request you to stay connected till the our Honorable Minister's speech. So he would be thanking you all. So now the third session starts. It is by Dr. Pooja Kashya. She is the pediatric cardiologist Director of an Adult Congenital Program and Assistant Professor, University of Texas, USA. So our topic is cardiologist point of view for COVID-19, cardiac involvement in COVID-19 and MISI, role of cardiac echocardiography test, how does it affect management, when do we start anticoagulation and how long we continue. Cardiology follow-up after severe COVID-19 and MISI. And the time duration is 15 minutes. Okay, over to Dr. Puja. Please stay connected. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Very good morning to everybody. And uh, namaste to Honorable Health Minister Ji, Dr. Bana Gupta. And uh, thank you, Dr. Bharti Kashyap, for uh, arranging this. Um, I um, am I'm very pleased to hear all, all during introduction that how motivated and committed um, Everybody is there at Jharkhand and uh, in India to fight this COVID. And it is very encouraging. And uh, I'm really thankful to all of you there who are actually the front line and um, helping all the patients there. So thank you. Now, uh, Dr. Ravi Kashyap and Dr. Bullet, thank you. Uh, you have uh, taken the brunt of explaining everything about COVID-19 and MISC, which makes uh, my job really simple because I only deal with a little portion there, which is the cardiac. So it should be, um, it is small, but it is very, very, very important. So um, without wasting any time, let's, uh, are you guys able to see my slides? Um, yeah, okay. Yes. So um, objectives, um, the evolution of COVID-19 and the MISC really interests me, the timeline. So I'll just briefly go over that. I'm sure all of you know that. Um, and the cardiac manifestations in COVID-19, what is the major difference between adults and pediatrics? That's, I think, the key there. And just to recognize that the heart is now involved and Let's um, manage that and then support the heart and let's get the patient out of the hospital and prevent the mortality. Essentially, that is the gist of my talk. And what are the key points and the best things that you're looking for while you're managing the patient? So uh, it was late 2019, somewhere in December, when in China, Wuhan, China, as we all know that there was severe acute respiratory uh, syndrome that started um, 
caused by virus, coronavirus too, and then the disease started to be called as COVID-19. By March 11th of 2020, it was declared as pandemic. April 27, 2020, that is almost five months after this, UK started seeing this hyperinflammation kind of syndrome, Kawasaki-like disease in kids, and they started to look, look into it more. And by May 1st, they defined it as pediatric inflammatory multisystem syndrome, which was temporarily associated with SARS COVID infection. Not too long after that, in May, it came to US and the New York City started Department of Health started now getting the, you know, more aware and started looking into these cases. By May 2020 late, the CDC had given it a name. It is MISC, right? And it is, it's been there, but COVID-19 has been there and there has been first wave, second wave, and now we are preparing for the third wave. After the second wave, um, I would say there were a little more awareness about MISE, so we knew a little more cases, the way I see it. Uh, the first wave, the lag for the onset of MISE uh, kind of did not reflect upon the number of cases. So coming to the cardiac manifestation and COVID-19 in adults, you see it right away during the acute infection. The heart in some patients is involved, there is myocardial dysfunction, kind of MI picture and cardiogenic shock and effusion. In pediatric patients, um, like the previous two speakers mentioned, the initial COVID-19 infection is mild and um, we do not see cardiac involvement in the acute phase. So much so that when after four to six weeks if the child presents, they don't even know sometimes that we have COVID. Um, but then we see all the similar features that we have seen in adults um, to a different degree, myocardial dysfunction, myocarditis, and of course, coronary artery involvement, which confuses us about Kawasaki. I still remember it was um, April, uh, I think it was somewhere around April or May that we suddenly started seeing more Kawasaki disease in the ICU and we started getting more consults. And we were like, what is going on here? And this was right about the time when all of this was coming up. So yes, Kawasaki disease manifestation kind of confuses with the COVID-19 MISC. The key thing is that um, COVID-19 initial infection would be mild and it would the MISC would be four to six weeks after the peak incidence of COVID-19 infection in a set geographic area. So if there has been an outbreak and increased number of cases of COVID-19 in say one city, one state, um, you would see or you should anticipate or prevent and prepare for seeing cluster of a few of these MISC cases four to six weeks later in that geographic area. That is how the trend has been. And it is all secondary to the post-infectious immune mediated complication. So the rapid PCR test that you would do would most likely be negative, but the serology may be positive in 75 to 90%. Now there has been some cases in which none of these tests have been positive. Um, again, not going into the details of the symptoms, but the key things are, the way I put it in my mind is that if there has been fever and um, Kawasaki-like symptoms and definitely GI symptoms, gastrointestinal where there is nausea, abdominal pain, get alerted, get BNP and troponin and echocardiogram and you would know what is going on with the child. So like I said, the cardiac manifestation, essentially what SARS does is it essentially attacks the multi-system. It, it attacks the cardiac organ, the gastrointestinal, organ, the lungs, the renal, and the skin. It's all part of that immune mediated complex reaction. And that what causes this endothelial injury and hypercoagulability. That is what we see. So this is a simple slide, a table that I took from how to approach 
and when to consider pediatric cardiology referral for COVID-19 patients. This was published in November of 2020 in the Pediatric Cardiology Journal here. It, I think, puts everything, uh, it's a good gist of things, where initially you would see the symptoms listed and the test, followed by the red flags, where if there has been fever for more than three days, clinical features of Kawasaki, shock, heart failure, then what all tests you should do. Tire one and tire two, like Dr. Bullet had mentioned, um, I am biased because I'm cardiologist. I would say if you're getting CRP and ESR, just get the BNP and troponin if you are suspecting, you know. And um, if those are elevated, um, yes, then you need to start thinking about how to get this patient to a place where I can get a baseline EKG, where I can get an echocardiogram if needed, because sometimes the initial presentation is not shock. It is not obvious. It could be just a mild dysfunction, but the kid would still need support. So, um, so MISC and Kawasaki, like I said, it kind of confused us. Um, our, you know, cardiology colleagues were like, what is this? And I think I just listed here the key differences. And I just want you to know that if the age of the child is above eight, it is kind of less likely that it is gonna be Kawasaki. That's just my um, kind of cheat sheet. So age, onset. Usually five days of illness is what you see with Kawasaki. Here we see about three to four days. Shock is very rare in Kawasaki. So 50% of the presenting cases of MISC and COVID in shock definitely is COVID, no matter what the test shows. Negative COVID, it doesn't matter. Treat the shock, think about it. GI symptoms, is definitely more common in MISC. So not taking too much time here. Again, I listed BNP and troponin because I'm a big fan of those two labs. They can save lives. So um, besides the BNP and troponin, CRP, fibronogen, ferritin, and D-dimer, these are the top labs that help us as cardiologists. Of course, this is just in continuation of Dr. Bullitt's uh, talk. So that is all the major key points. This is just the cardiac from the cardiologist standpoint. Um, so now what do we do? We have established the kids BNP is high, troponin is high, uh, CRP is high, has Kawasaki symptoms. Now the kid I am just gonna assume is in um, a tertiary hospital where there is facility to get echocardiogram, EKG. Okay, so now the key thing is get focused echocardiogram because you really don't want to expose the tech or the physician who's doing the echo to get into the details and getting all the images and the protocol, which takes idly, it takes about 30 to 40 minutes to get a full echocardiogram. I would not suggest that, that you do that. And neither does the American Society of Echocardiography does. They came up with this whole list of, of, uh, protocols and you know situations where the echocardiogram was really so mandatory to put that staff to that exposure to COVID, if that makes sense. So essentially what you're looking for is left and right ventricular function, the pericardium, if there has been pericardial effusion or not, any valvular dysfunction, which means mitral valve regurg, coronary arteries, um, and in kids, one of the other differences between adults and kids is that you put the probe on the child and you can see coronary arteries clear. In adults, we don't give those images with the echo, so it's hard. So this is the advantage. And so the echocardiogram views, just get two views. You know, if there is a technician there who does the echocardiogram, train them to just get the apical four chamber and short axis, and then move on to subcostal views if at all needed. But, you know, and if you have any questions about this in terms of the protocols, I'll be happy to share with you guys. And then have availability of the pediatric echocardiogram probes, because generally for adults, we use probe size 2.5 to five, but for pediatric, you need 
a higher frequency probe because it needs lesser penetration. So uh, just having those probes with you will help you. So like I said, the most common that we see is left ventricular dysfunction. And then the second is the coronary artery aneurysm and dilation. I personally have seen in only two of the patients. So it's, it's fairly uncommon, more common in Kawasaki. Pericardial effusion, you will see it's very common and mitral regurgitation also. Um, so these are some views, um, which essentially the first is showing you the dilation of the right coronary artery. Like I said, the kids give really good images of the coronary arteries. The second one shows the mitral regurgitation, so the little blue flash that is going into the upper chamber, which is the left atrium. And the third picture is pericardial effusion. It is collection of more fluid around the heart, which can affect it hemodynamically and cause lower blood pressure if it is large effusion. And the, the picture right below it is the myocardial dysfunction, which is also you can get from apical four views, just the ejection fraction, which is the key. And the one right next to it is this balloon looking lower chamber, which is the left ventricle, which is dilated and its function is down. So all of these key five images you can get from the two views that I mentioned. Now EKG. Um, EKG is really essential because um, we have seen in MISC that there are certain arrhythmias, especially in adults now that arrhythmias do occur and they are associated with high mortality. So having a baseline EKG, placing the patient on a continuous telemetry where we can actually monitor the rhythm would be excellent. Um, also to keep in mind is sometimes there are electrolyte disturbances like low sodium, low potassium, calcium, and all of that can throw some abnormal ventricular premature beats. Um, we have to be on top of those to correct those. Um, most commonly, we have also seen sinus node dysfunction and bradycardia, PR prolongation, and um, the inherited channelopathies, which are essentially um, a real big major cause of sudden cardiac death in certain kids that have not been recognized, we have seen sometimes it kind of gets unmasked. You come to know that the kid now has prolonged QT because of the fever that a child is having, you, you kind of recognize Brugada pattern. So all of these things, unless you have a baseline EKG and you follow it along, you won't be able to recognize. So it's, it's very helpful. Now coronary involvement, like I mentioned, it's not as common, but still it is there because it kind of directs our therapy. We do measure the size of the coronary arteries and kind of adjust it to the patient's height and body surface area, which essentially gives us the Z-score and that decides as to what we are doing with this patient in terms of anticoagulation and the follow-ups and the advanced imaging. So it's kind of very valuable information. So management consideration, again, BNP and troponin, echocardiogram, continuous telemetry, and hemodynamic support, okay? Of course, the key is to determine the level of care first, which has been touched base before, so going forward. So um, recommended timeline, I think, is the key as to when should you now, you've gotten, you've gotten the initial echocardiogram. It says, let's pick a number. Let's say normal is about 55% and above of the ejection fraction. And let's say the child has ejection fraction of 55%, which is low normal. And otherwise the patient is hemodynamically stable. The blood pressures are great, just has fever um, and some respiratory symptoms is on binasal cannula really not requiring that much support. So you say, okay, let us let me put this child on an acute care floor. And now what do I do? Number one, always put this kid, I would suggest that have this kid on a continuous telemetry bed so that you can monitor the rhythm. Second, if you are admitting 
and you have a baseline echo repeated in two days, unless there has been some change in the clinical status. Just make sure that the inflammation and the immune response has not caused increase in the pericardial effusion, has not resulted in coronary artery dilation, and has not resulted in any decreased function. So kind of if the patient is in the hospital, just get, you know, repeat the echo in two to three days. But if the patient directly goes to the ICU because of the hemodynamic instability, then we do recommend to follow echocardiograms daily to almost every alternate day. Just till the time the patient has started de-intensifying means that is requiring less inotropes, has required less respiratory support. If BNP and troponin are trending towards you know, normalization, like their trend is now decreasing and it's reassuring, then yes, you can say, okay, let's get the echo in two to three days. But till then, just be on a high alert. And you know, part of this is because it is an evolving condition. It's not like the first echo is fine, so everything would be fine. It all depends on the clinical status. So having that facility in the hospital is very essential. Advanced imaging, um, I'll come to it later. Um, so again, management, um, just going by the three major things that we see in the heart, myocarditis or myocardial injury. First thing, look at the function, labs and echo, and treatment usually is diuretics, just because you have to be a little careful about the fluid balance. If the heart function is not optimal, you cannot really fluid overload the patient. So the patient needs diuretics and heart failure therapy as needed. Now, does the patient need IVIG or not? I would refer to that American rheumatology uh, recommendations as to when to start giving IVIG. But if the patient is on the floor and is otherwise recovering, I don't see the need. We have not really practiced that here. But if the patient is hemodynamically unstable, is in shock, the first thing is, like Dr. Bullitt said, take care of the shock and the sepsis first. Let the labs and the echo speak later and do the cardiac stuff later. You have to manage the patient as a shock patient. And we have seen that it is mostly a vasoplegic shock. So you need like norepi or epi. Now, if the echo and BNP um, are elevated and echo is showing cardiac dysfunction, our favorite go-to drug is milrinone. But you can add that uh, milrinone only if the blood pressures are holding. And I love that slide where Dr. Bullard mentioned the normal blood pressure parameters, which is the key. Now, again, for me who just gets into the key buzz numbers, if it's less than 70 in a pediatric population, systolic is less than 70, you need epi or norepi to even consider milrinone to add on because milrinone is an afterload reducer. It will reduce your blood pressure further and it can cause problems. And of course, add diuretics. So be careful with milrinone and that st standpoint. If the kidney functions are really bad, um, milrinone is usually not indicated. So look into all those things before we start milrinone. Now, sometimes you would need mechanical ventilation just to reduce the metabolic demand if the function, cardiac function is low. So uh, sometimes respiratory support, and I love that question that when do you escalate the care, um, what Dr. Devaker said, is that when do you start weaning? So it's if the cardiac function is not good, if the blood gases are showing acidosis, lactates are high, you have to kind of say how much weaning of the respiratory support can we actually do at this point. Then comes anticoagulation, which I'm gonna go later in the next slide. It depends upon the parameters, which was already touched. IVIG is a great drug that that has been extrapolated from the management of Kawasaki. And we do give IVIG to all the patients who are hemodynamically unstable, um, followed by a diuretic, because again, you don't want to fluid overload this patient. And if the patient is in refractory shock, is requiring more than two inotropes, steroids 
are great. They also help in maintaining the blood pressures and calming down the immune response. As regards the EKG and arrhythmias, electrolytes, the key thing, be on top of it. I think that has helped us a lot. Aggressive fever management, and then just keep them on continuous telemetry. They will probably settle out. Now there is a website that kind of gives us the list of drugs that can prolong QT. It's the crediblemeds.org. We refer to that a lot just to see if we are giving any antibiotics to a patient that might prolong the QT, just to kind of keep it in the back of your mind. Um, and that's why EKGs help because the telemetry does not show you the QT interval that well, but the EKG kind of just calculates for you. So QTC is really good to have. Now, anticoagulation therapy is guided by the Kawasaki guidelines. We love aspirin. Um, and then um, going forward, let's go to the reason why we need to be on anticoagulation, that is who are at risk of developing thrombus, severe LV dysfunction, which is EF of less than 35%, elevated D-dimer, and um, coronary artery enlargement. Yes, aneurysm, uh, start anticoagulation. So low dose aspirin is our favorite for all sorts of things. Um, for cardiac, cardiologists love aspirin. Um, just start them on if the platelet count is above 80,000, that's, it's not gonna hurt the patient. Um, and then continue it um, at least till the time the patient is asymptomatic. Um, we sometimes continue it as outpatient depending on how you know the patient recovered, but it's not indicated at this time. It is indicated in Kawasaki though. Um, now, when the key is when do you start uh, Lovenox or anoxaparin or warfarin and it, in addition to the aspirin, and that's where the coronary artery aneurysm come into play, or if there is also a documented thrombus. So if the patient has documented thrombus, it has to be continued for at least three months after the resolution of thrombus. If the patient had low EF, then at least continue for two weeks after discharge. And if the patient had coronary artery aneurysm with the Z-score of 10, it's indefinite. You don't know when you're gonna stop unless the aneurysm resolves. We don't know the timeline yet. Um, the good thing is, um, this is just a reference I put in there just to kind of, it's more so for reassurance that if we recognize this MISC, um, and the cardiac manifestation in comparison with the adults, um, the last bolded line is that mortality in children with MISC is very uncommon. Number one, it is a rare condition. And number two, if it is managed uh, timely, it's zero mortality. You know, the kids recover really well. This one I put in there as a reference from a General of American College of Cardiology, just to emphasize that these patients who have had some sort of cardiac involvement during the hospitalization, they do need continued follow-up for echo and EKG, because even though the ejection fraction is normalized before discharge, there has been ECHO study that has been done, which shows that there's an entity called as diastolic dysfunction, which persists much longer and needs follow-up, which can then result in sudden cardiac events as outpatient. So we need the follow-up after the discharge. I know we are talking about PICQ and developing the infrastructure, and I would really request you to consider this to kind of incorporate that in the plan where the patient who has been admitted in the ICU has had cardiac involvement, gets a way to come back into the outpatient clinic to follow up after he has been discharged. So um, this is um, cardiac follow-up guidelines where just as a blanket statement, I'm very comfortable saying 
that the kid who's had cardiac involvement needs to follow up within two weeks of discharge with an echocardiogram and EKG. And this has been extrapolated from the various protocols and the guidelines which have come out for um, MISC so far. Um, and also to get an EKG, because we have seen that there has been some progressive conduction abnormalities, meaning there has been noted to have some heart blocks, prolonged PR intervals, some sinus node dysfunction in these patients. So we had required a more close monitoring. And of course, for anticoagulation, if the patient is on anticoagulation, we have to follow those patients. So in summary, recognition is the key. Once you have recognized and triaged the patient to the appropriate level of care, which I thank the health ministry and government of India to give so much support and to create the PICUs to train the staff, the physicians, the paramedical staff in preparation for the third wave. It's, it's really commendable. I think triaging those patients to appropriate level of care, this is where the key lies. And a good communication, like Dr. Kashyap mentioned initially, just having that relationship with these centers and just establishing a go-to place would really help. And the time it would reduce the time that you would take to send this patient to the appropriate level of care. So I think that's great. And availability of a rapid diagnostic test, including the serology test, would be key just to help. Fully staffed and equipped critical care and the acute care floor is would be you know a blessing. And you guys are really working hard on that. And echocardiogram and electrocardiogram is. It's my bread and butter, not because of that, but because it is needed. It is needed in this in these patients. So having the probes, you know, talking to the techs, okay, the echo technicians, you're comfortable getting these views. Do you have what you need for the echo machines? Do you have a cardiologist out there who can read it? You know, and the electrocardiogram, the way you place the leads on the pediatric population, you're aware how to do that. It's great. 24 hour staff labs so that you can get the labs required, especially the BNP and troponin back on timely basis to give the patient enough support from medication standpoint. Advanced imaging. So I think I skipped that previously, but advanced imaging like CT and MRI are recommended. And the way I see it is that if you're seeing a coronary artery dilation and it is more than Z score of 10, you would probably need a cardiac CT just to know if there is a thrombus in it or not, or is it diffuse? Is it going into the extensive branching? Because you can't get that from echo. But you can use cardiac CT used for adults. It is just the protocol that is different. So it is not that difficult to get a cardiac CT because coronary artery involvement in adults is very common. And MRI is not needed right away. They can be sent three to six months after the MISC or cardiac involvement to a center which specializes in that just to get an idea about the LV dysfunction if we need to. And of course, having the medications which are commonly used as first line, like norepi, epi, mildenone, IVIG, steroids, lovenox, aspirin, just having it handy is great so there is no time lag in having the patient. And of course, outpatient clinic incorporation somehow into all of this would be great. And that's it. Heart is nice and sweet and small. So any yeah. questions for me? Dr. Divakar, please unmute Dr. Divakar. Thank you, Dr. Kashyap. So uh, thank you so much, Dr. Pooja. Actually, there are more than uh, 210 doctors who are connected and they are listening. But as there is no question in the question box, we are un not unmuting them because it will create a lot of jobs. So Dr. Divakar is there. He is heading the Tata Main Hospital Pediatric Unit in uh, Jamshedpur. So Dr. over to Dr. Divakar. Do you have any question, Dr. Divakar? And thank you, Dr. Kashyap, uh, for... Uh such extensive presentation in a short time. Uh, you covered almost everything. Uh, 
uh, what we have seen in our practice that uh, children with a fever and uh, they do not fulfill the uh, for all the criteria of the MISP-C, but they have the inflammatory marker high. So your experience and how do you manage them? So they might have rest, but they do not fulfill the two clinical criteria. Sometimes uh, they are uh, RT-PCR COVID positive. So it's very difficult to see that so this inflammation is because of hyperinflammation, hyperinflammation or because of due to COVID. So your experience and how do you manage them? Um, so thank you, Dr. Devaka, for such a good question. Like I said, it has been puzzling us a lot here as well. So you're not the only one, <laughs> trust me. But um, so Mike, uh, just one information before I answer your question is, do they have only elevation of the inflammatory markers or do they have inflammatory markers elevated and BNP and troponin elevated? So BNP we are not doing, we do not have the facility. Uh, troponin, so uh, they have the, since they do not fulfill the clinical criteria, so we are not going to tier two investigation, but they have high CRP or ESR, they have the lymphopenia, and uh, mm -hmm. one of the patient was the COVID positive, otherwise the antibody positive. So it was very hard for us. Is it, is it because of the COVID or cardiac yeah. function were normal? So we did the echo okay. and cardiac function were normal and we didn't do the top, uh, top of me. Okay. So in, so in this case, um, I'll be very honest. Um, our first go-to thing is BNP and troponin. That's our first thing that we go to. And I, I have seen normal cardiac function. It is not uncommon via echo, no effusion, but troponin of 15. The normal here in our lab is less than 0 0.05. So, but it was elevated to 15. So it is something which is, I would say if you have the facility or if you can push the administration to get you that, that would be great in future. However, if there is a doubt, I would consider them and treat them as likely COVID MIC as well, because there is no change in medical management. If you take them as Kawasaki, right? Let's just say you say it's not COVID, it's Kawasaki. Cardiac function is normal. You're still gonna follow them up. You're still gonna give them aspirin, high dose till the fever resolution is there. And then you're gonna put them on low dose aspirin, right? you're still gonna treat them with IVIG if the fever doesn't resolve, right? So the, the good thing is the treatment protocol is the same and you are getting echo, which is reassuring. So I think you're doing all the right thing. The only thing I would change is add troponin and uh, BNP if possible. If not, just follow them um, in future as outpatient, like they were Kawasaki and just keep a close eye on them. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you, most of it. So probably even if they are, do not fulfill a clinical criteria and they have the hyperinflammation, you still go to tier two investigation and they found it positive, you treat with IVIG. Is this what I wanted to convey? If it is elevated troponin and BNP, we do treat with IVIG, especially if it is elevated troponin because it is, I think I didn't touch base on that because myocarditis is an entity which we see also, as you know, right? And um, that is diagnosed purely by troponin I or BNP elevation, and that requires IVIG treatment plus minus in different papers what you, you know, uh, follow. But um, so we do treat with IVIG if troponins are elevated. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Bhati Kashyap, do we have time for uh, any more question or are you going to find it? Dr. Kashyap, uh, I have another question. I'm used to uh, measuring ejection fraction on the plex, the longitudinal axis. So how do you do it mm -hmm. on, on the four chamber view? Is it, uh, can you do it quickly? That's why you're suggesting? Uh, so, Ejection fraction, you can measure via two ways. Number one is M mode that you can do either in parasternal long axis or short axis. 
Now, short axis view, I like it because it also gives you coronary artery information, pericardial effusion information, and LVH. You can see because you just have to kind of sweep and you will get all this information from short axis and you can get the M mode. So that is what um, I go by. I, I don't recommend going to Paris on a long axis just because it takes a lot of time. Um, second, apical view, you can get the EF by doing the Simpsons biplane, either in apical four or apical two. That you can measure after you have acquired the image. So acquire the image on the patient, get a nice apical four and an apical two view, and then you can, depending on the machine, which mostly every machine has that, is you can post-process and measure the Simpsons biplane and get the ejection fraction, which is very accurate. Does that help? Yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot. And how do you define severe cardiac dysfunction? Is it an objective criteria on ejection fraction or just the yes. eyeballing? No, it is EF of less than 35%. So less than 35% is severe. And when you put them the heparin, uh, and low molecular heparin, so when do you switch over to warfarin? Because they will go for, for long-term uh, anticoagulation. Yes. And obviously so you can't like, on the subcutaneous subcut heparin. Yes, so we can, uh, depending on um, how, you know, when you want to do it in terms of discharge planning, but you can, um, so which drug are you using for outpatient? Like, what do you send them on? So we prefer warfarin uh, because, uh, because of the logistic, uh, many of them will not be able to get the subcute uh, low molecular weight heparin. Sure. So then you would have to monitor the INR, right? So for that purposes, I would say start transitioning them um, at least four to five days in advance so that you can get a baseline INR, which should be at least 1.8, if not more. Um, 1.8 to two would give you a very reasonable uh, anticoagulation uh, because normal is 1.2. So as far as you are close to 1.8, you can send them home and kind of monitor as outpatient. Does that help? Any, yeah, yeah. Any experience with oral anticoagulation, apexaben or something in children? Um, we, because our we adult colleagues, because in adults, our colleagues are using uh, oral anticoagulation apexabine on discharge. Yes, yes, you can use those. You can use absolutely. So small, even small children, five to ten years old. You can, yes. yes, you can. So there is a um, question from Dr. Partha, the, uh, and Dr. Bullet has already answered that if there is no coronary artery dilation and there is no coronary artery aneurysm, but D-dimer is very much raised. So in that case, will you give anticoagulation? Not only aspirin, Dr. Bullet has answered, if D-dimer is raised five times more than normal, then yes, anticoagulation plus aspirin. Okay, Dr. Puja? That's correct, that's correct. D-dimer, okay. if it's elevated by itself, is a criteria to start anticoagulation. Yes. So uh, what is the dose of annex, uh, uh, you call it? Apexabine. apexabine. What is the dose of apexabine? Dose, but I so, I am going back to the... So we go by the... Factor 10A level, we maintain that for appropriate anticoagulation. It okay. usually started one mg per kick. And then we escalated depending on the blood levels. Okay, so the question of Dr. Partha is all clear. Dr. Divakar, we asked a lot of questions. So uh, all clear. So now I am going to request our Honorable Health Minister, Government of Jharkhand, to address the gathering.
There are more than 210 pediatricians working in the government sector or across Jharkhand who are connected and are listening. Over to you, sir. Is sir audible? Sir, ki awaz ko Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. आवाज आ रही है मेरी सबसे पहले मैं बहुत बधाई देता हूं कोविड-19 थर्ड वेव इंटरनेशनल पीआईसी और क्रिटिकल केयर ट्रेनिंग सिंपोजियम के सफल आयोजन के लिए मैं सबसे पहले डॉक्टर भारती कश्यप को बहुत-बहुत बधाई देता हूं और इस बात से मैं मानसिक रूप से सहमत हूं कि डॉक्टर भारती कश्यप एक ना थकने वाली और ना हारने वाली एक महिला सशक्तिकरण की दिशा को मजबूत करने वाली एक महिला चिकित्सक और समाज सुधारक हैं इसके लिए मैं उनको बहुत-बहुत बधाई देता हूं बहुत-बहुत शुभकामना देता हूं आज के इस सफल कार्यक्रम के बहुत मजबूत आउटपुट होंगे ऐसी मुझे संभावनाएं हैं और आज के कार्यक्रम में जिस तरीके से हम सारे लोग बहुत गंभीरता पूर्वक हमारे वरीय चिकित्सकों की बात सुन रहे थे सबसे पहले मैं उन चिकित्सकों को भी बहुत धन्यवाद देता हूं जो आज अमेरिका में रात ढाई बजे बैठकर हमारी समस्याओं के प्रति गहन चिंतन मनन कर रहे हैं और आज उनका हॉलिडे भी है और छुट्टी के दिन होने के बाद भी उन्होंने रात को इतनी गंभीर विषय में अपने चिकित्सक अनुभव को प्रदान किया है इसके लिए मैं राज्य सरकार की तरफ से बहुत आभार और धन्यवाद व्यक्त करता हूं विशेष करके डॉक्टर रवि कश्यप डॉक्टर योजा बुलेट डॉक्टर पूजा कश्यप और साथ में जुड़े हमारे सभी वरीय चिकित्सकों के प्रति भी बहुत मैं राज्य सरकार की तरफ से आभार व्यक्त करता हूं आज के इस कार्यक्रम में हमारे एडिशनल चीफ सेक्रेटरी आदरणीय अरुण सिंह जी हमारे एनएचएम के डायरेक्टर रवि कांत शुक्ला जी ऑल इंडिया मेडिकल एसोसिएशन के अध्यक्ष डॉक्टर जय लाल ऑनरेबल ऑल इंडिया मेडिकल एसोसिएशन के महामंत्री डॉक्टर जयेश लेल लेले हमारी बहन डॉक्टर सुधा और यशोधा यशोधा और हमारे झारखंड प्रांत के ऑल इंडिया मेडिकल एसोसिएशन के अध्यक्ष बड़े भाई अरुण सिंह जी महामंत्री बड़े भाई प्रदीप जी और जमशेदपुर से अभी बातचीत कर रहे डॉक्टर दिवाकर जी मैं सभी चिकित्सकों की बहुत गंभीरता पूर्वक बातों को सुन रहा था और जिस तरीके से कोविड-19 का एक अभिशाप पूरी दुनिया के सामने प्रस्तुत हुआ है और फर्स्ट वेव को हमने देखा हमारे एडिशनल चीफ सेक्रेटरी साहब ने कहा कि फर्स्ट वेव से कई ज्यादा गुना सीवियर सेकंड वेव था और जैसे-जैसे दुनिया के वैज्ञानिकों ने आशंका व्यक्त की है थर्ड वेव के आने की संभावनाएं व्यक्त की हैं और इस बात की तरफ भी ध्यान आकृष्ट किया है कि इसकी विभिषिका छोटे बच्चों पर और अल्प वयस्कों पर पड़ने की संभावनाओं की तरफ ध्यान आकृष्ट किया है और निश्चित तौर पर हम माननीय मुख्यमंत्री जी के नेतृत्व में 
लगातार इस दिशा में कारगर रूप से काम कर रहे हैं और प्रयास कर रहे हैं कि दिन प्रतिदिन हमारे अंदर जो कोई खामी है उसको तो दूर करते हुए हम कैसे बेहतर प्रबंधन के साथ बेहतर स्वास्थ्य सेवा उपलब्ध कराएं इस दिशा पर हम बहुत मजबूती से आगे बढ़ रहे हैं और जब दुनिया के बड़े चिकित्सक डब्ल्यू एच ओ के डॉक्टर्स अमेरिका में बैठे इतने बड़े बड़े डॉक्टर्स जो रात को अपनी नींद को त्याग 